Right, so Pinergy today committed to hashtag power the difference for Orwell Wheelers Cycling Club in Dublin as part of a new three-year sponsorship deal with the club. The partnership will see Pinergy become the club's principal sponsor and official energy partner as well as the title sponsors of the Pinergy Orwell Wheelers Randonnée an annual 146km open road event which will take place in Dublin on Saturday, April the 30th. And I'm delighted to be joined by Olympic cyclist and former National Road Race champion Nicholas Roach. Uh, Nicholas, good morning to you. How are you? Good morning. How are you? Yeah, good. Um, you've recently also taken up a new role with Cycling Ireland. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yes. So back in January, I was approached by Cycling Ireland asking me if I wanted to look after initially the, the elite men's road team. So I'll be the the sports director, as they call it, for the Europeans and the World Championships this year. And I will do some appearances with some of the younger guys during the year, too. I will, I'm not sure. I think if there is a women team going there to the Worlds, I will also look after them, too. OK. Was that something that was on your radar or was this like completely out of the blue and you're thinking, actually, yeah, I could do that? It was something I always wished I was going to get the phone call the day I retired. And actually, when I retired... I was like, ah, oh, hopefully now someone's going to approach me. And and it took them a couple of months. But when I get the phone call, I was like, oh, yes, this is great. Uh, it's, I always said publicly that I wanted to get involved with Cycling Ireland and kind of give back my time to, to Cycling Ireland. And when I when I was initially, when I got the phone call, Nicholas, are you interested? I said, yes, straight away. So I, I was really happy. And the, the actual uh, technicalities of the role itself, is that something that you had been thinking about when you were still cycling? It is. Um, I always had it in the back of my mind that, that hopefully um, I could come on board, especially last year, one of my really good friends, Benati, was, uh, was appointed the, um, the, the CT, they call it, in Italy of the national team there. Uh, and I could just see him going to the races and, and getting behind the team and, and everything he was sharing just kind of gave me even more will to become that role in Ireland. My role in Ireland is not as important as his role in Italy. I'll be more focused essentially on the Europeans and the worlds. Um, is not a, is not a, we don't have a full international program the same way other bigger nations have. Um, a, cu- a couple of things. Is this something that you'd like to do for a team um, in the professional game as well? Is 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 that side of cycling something that kind of tactical technical side of trying to build a team and, and be a director sport chief? Is that something that is also in your future? So, so look, initially, six months ago, I, I was more focused on trying to go into commentary and on TV. And then I realized how much I've, I've had the opportunity to do it with Trinity Sport um, a few times this year as a sports director with the under-23 team. And I absolutely loved it. And I, I'm kind of looking more now into why not go into, into World Tour teams um, next year into the, the sports director role. I much prefer the kind of management, logistics and organization role rather than just actually being in the car and kind of directing i find it very limitating where i kind of like to get involved with the whole bigger picture but but one kind of goes with the other so so yeah it is something that i'm looking that i'm now looking at for for the for the future that i hadn't really ticked a couple of months back uh, I, again is that like were, were you one of those cyclists who when you were on one of the tours were kind of constantly chatting to the backroom staff going where are we going to be? What's the hotel like? Uh, you know, or were you literally like compared, uh, uh, interested in nothing except making sure that the uh, tires were pumped, the oil was on the chain, and you were ready to go? No, I, I wasn't quite excessive with the, the oil and the tires were pumped. You kind of have to, you know, there's you're you're surrounded, uh, hopefully by a bunch of professional um, staff, and 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 you you do hope that everyone does their job right. But I was always very talkative with the staff. I find that. You know, you're you're in a team, and a team is not a segregation of, of a group of cyclists and a group of staff. A team is a team. So even at breakfast, if I was, uh, I'm usually a, an early riser, and I'd like to go down, and I'd usually sit down and have a coffee with them, have a chat, talk about things, discuss things. If it could be mechanical, it could be about food or just about daily life. But I think it was really important to keep a close relationship with the staff. They may not help you win a race, but it's easy to lose a race when a staff doesn't look after you the way you should. And I think it's very important to one to respect them because they are part as a team, uh, as as a whole. And and I think it just creates a better vibe in the team when you when you look after the staff. But I wouldn't go and 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 double check if my tires were were pumped. I'd kind of ask him in the morning the pressure, and if he'd say if it's six point eight, well that's okay at six point eight. I wouldn't go and squeeze with my finger to double check his work. Yeah, well, that's fair enough. That's uh, good man management. Uh, it does sound like you were kind of always in the back of your mind, preparing yourself for a life after cycling. 
and and it also strikes me listening to you that you you had kind of the perfect career to become somebody who is involved at that because you understand pretty much every aspect of it. You understand the responsibilities of the team leader, but you also understand the responsibilities of the domestique and then the young rider coming through who has pressure on them because they've got to get the contract and, and you also had a bit of pressure because of who your dad was as well. So it's a, a unique skill set and experience that you will bring to this. Yeah, you, you've actually summed it up better than I would have. Uh, and it's true, during my career, I, w I was lucky enough to, to go through the whole the rise of you know trying to make it true and, and also trying to you know initially when I turned pro there was always high expectations and it was easier for me to disappoint and I was always trying to to prove myself to take it step by step and then going into a young team leader with all the responsibilities to then going into the domestique and then finally finishing uh, being really kind of the mentor with the, the young guys in, in, in team DSM so I kind of covered the whole the whole circus and um, and, and I've been, I've seen the good and the bads. And when I was at domestique, I could understand the what a team leader needed because I, when I was in that position, I remember when I was a team leader. I remember when the guys did this, and when we rode on this side of the road, and when so I could kind of relate to and anticipate some of the needs of the team leaders. And in the same way, when when the young guys are there, I still remember my fears, like if it was yesterday, and trying to reconfort them and give them a lot of my experience that I had through through the seventeen years. So you know, finishing as a as a, um, as a road captain, as they called it, I think kind of that kind of naturally goes into the role as a sports director because you, when you're a road captain, you're basically a sports director on the road. Is becoming the director sportif of, of Cycling Ireland a, a, a help then when it comes to actually getting one of those jobs? Because what's that process? It, you know, in football, we understand that, you know, unless uh, it's very, very unusual for somebody to walk straight into one of the big teams, you kind of have to work your way up. But for you to get into one of the world tour teams, how, how would that actually happen? So, um, firstly, I need to go through this um, course, which is in October. So I applied for the course in, in, in February. Um, so once I get that, um, that that course validated, then I can access to the World Tour. So you can actually start being a sports director in, in continental level and continental pro level. So the division one and uh, two and three to make it easier to understand. So the World Tour, you need to have this, um, this course validated. Uh, and then obviously, then you have to be sourced by, by one of the teams. So the same way as you, you get approached by, by, by teams as a rider, it's a bit the same um, for, for a sports director. So it's going to be my, my job to kind of make a few phone calls and, and hope someone picks the phone up and, and, and agrees to, one, start talking about a project and, and two, uh, agreeing on a job. And is there is there an assistant sports director role? Or like is there a role that you can take that isn't the big job straight away? Um, no, the, well... There is what well, what they will do is they'll send you on the lighter program uh, and maybe not on the on the world tour level or you'd be a, what they call it a second sports director so a little bit what you were saying now where you'd be sitting in the car next to it and kind of learning process or be and then they'll give you the chance to be a, a sole director on some of the smaller races so um, so there is they don't just throw you in there and you, you drive in the Tour de France straight away um, you you kind of have it's the same way as a rider you just kind of have to build your your profile. And also learn because being you know behind the car is one thing driving behind the race is one thing but it's all you know today there's so much technology available that you spend so much time analyzing um the terrain now so you do you know all these presentations and pdfs in the morning it's not like before i remember my my first races they'd come up with a map and they they draw an arrow for this for where the wind was coming and they draw like a little <laughs> triangle for where the mountains are now everything is done with a, a, a program called Velo viewer and you can access to the to the to, to speed bump and you have to kind of click on that speed bump and say right, this, this is the speed bump 500 meters to the line or this roundabout and you and, and there's so much work to do uh, that is not just about telling the guys what tactics they're gonna apply to the race it sounds like being a director sportive 20 years ago would have been a way easier job than now. A hundred percent, yeah. <laughs> how, how does it differ then in terms of the, the personalities of some of the people in, in those positions comparing the start of your career to now? Well, today, uh, I believe there's a lot more responsibilities as a sports director. Um, also because there's also less freedom. There, there is a bigger management set up will, <clears throat> who will actually kind of give you or guide you through some of the goals they will want to achieve during the year, but also race per race. And your 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 role as a sports director now is also to follow 
um, what you're told from a higher management um, board, basically, where before I think the sports director had a little bit more freedom in in what he was doing on the day with the riders he had available. So I think everything has gone more and more controlled. Uh, and as cycling is developing and there's new roles and there's, it's getting more and more professional again, um, you kind of have very, very set and specific roles and every role has his limitations as well. And sports directors has new limitations too. And you have to kind of fit in with the general management's um, tactics, basically. Is there a complicated element that comes with that over a period of time as well, Nico, whereby you've got people who are funding teams who like to have a little bit of control over the team. Like it's something that we would have seen quite a bit in Drive to Survive with regards to Formula One, where team principles will be under the thumb a little bit from certain owners who who are real petrol heads themselves and really wanted to have their say. Is, is that a reality in cycling as well? It is not as much. Uh, I don't know if you remember when I was at a team, Team Cuff, um, our, 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 our crazy owner Oleg was uh, was a bit like that, and he he liked to have the last say. And you know, there was one day so he he always on the Giro, for example, he'd cycle on the side of the road in the morning uh, and leave the hotel at seven and, and just go and ride his bike. And we'd we'd catch him halfway up the, the the race, and he'd be on the side of the road and he'd jump into one of the the, the team cars. And regardless uh, of the tactics of the morning, sometimes he'd just take the radio in the car and start giving you new orders. And that was his <laughs> way of seeing it. So, so that, I've, I've had the, the chance to, to have that experience <laughs> to my book too, uh, where, where some of the team owners just completely kind of um, let the passion um, take, take over their, their actual uh, role of, of a team owner and not a team uh, director and even less a sports director. But, you know, I think... Uh, today, every team has a bit of an identity that most teams um, are, are run with with a management board where the, the owners are are not that much involved apart from two or three different teams. Like I said, I think the, the, the most striking one I remember for, was uh, was Tinkoff back in 2014 all the way to 16 or 17. Right. Um, just on this time of year, uh, Nico, the, the, I guess we're coming into kind of nice weather now, but like when you're watching cycling in February, March, I presume now that you're off the saddle, you have no envy whatsoever of people who are in the peloton at, at that point. And it's only now that maybe you start to think, God, I'd like to be out there. Exactly. It's easy in the month of December when it's when it's raining and it's cold and you start looking the first races in January, February, and everyone's wearing leg warmers and crashing and, and mucky faces and just the, the pain. And again, all the stress of the, the, the cycling and, and racing in, in the rain. And then now you look at the videos uh, on TV and it's 20 plus degrees as uh, the racing starting to look really good again. And I'm kind of saying, ah, you know, that, that's the cycling that I love. I used to love um, from the second part of the year, from, from, from April uh, all the way to August. Those were my kind of favorite months. Uh, so, so now and also I, I was so, so taken with the dancing that I kind of um, was able to kind of step away from cycling. And now that I'm back, and I have a bit more time to, to, to go on the bike. And, you know, last week I was back in, inside of France and training with some of my friends who were, who were they were leaving to race this weekend. Um, it does feel sometimes that I, that I that it's like, oh, maybe I could do it another year. But obviously, you know, I think that if I went back in the bunch and again, when, when I, all the conditions are perfect, yes, it's enjoyable. But you, you sometimes I'm just, you know, you look, you always, your memory is very selective. You always remember the good mm -hmm. moments and not the tough moments when you're lying on the ground with your, your knees bleeding out and, and a couple of guys sitting on top of you. Was there any event early in the year that was particularly grim, routinely? Uh, um, I think at the beginning of the Dance with the Stars, I was still feeling very guilty uh, about not going out training. And I was going out early mornings, in the evenings, doing 10K runs. And, and it was very hard for me to get out of that, um, that routine of thinking that I was still a professional cyclist. There was a moment where the dancing became so competitive and I had to really push up my game that I was just too tired to go out on the bike. And I had to go out maybe once in, on Monday mornings was kind of be our half rest day. And, and I was able to really, really cut with the whole, I'm not a professional cyclist anymore. But, um, but, but still, uh, even today, that there are my body still kind of pushes me to go out training. Uh, the identity that you had as a professional cyclist it was very deep-seated and it sounds like the competition of 
uh, the dancing was important, but it also sounds like the future career still involved in the sport that you've given your life to is also important for you. Are you feeling now that you're more more you as a person than you were as a cyclist and that you're less the cyclist than you used to be? I think so. I think already the last couple of years of my career, um, when I was realizing that, you know, even in my cycling position, I was able to relax more as in when I, when you're a road captain, the pressure is not the same as when you're a team leader. When you're a team leader, sometimes you just have to give so much that you, you just pick your battles. You, you can't, you can't lose energy fighting over everything and you just kind of have to get on with things sometimes. Um, and, and that's the way of kind of you, you, you protect yourself. The, the later years of my career, I was able to be more, more accessible in, in many ways and also express myself uh, because I could actually go and, and challenge and I could actually go and give a stronger opinion. Um, now that I'm completely out of cycling, again, when I'm commentating, it's easier for me to, to be able to give an opinion and also because you actually see more when you're outside the cycling bubble than when you're stuck in it. Is that advice that you can then use when you're in your role with Ireland to the cyclists? Because like some of our cyclists at the moment are doing absolutely incredible and, and they probably still are in that bubble. Like, is that wisdom that you have acquired that you can impart now to them? I certainly hope so. And I think... Um, I think with with Cycling Ireland appointing me um, sports director, they they were hoping I would do that, and I certainly hope that I can bring as much uh, help, advice um, on, on different aspects, and you know even in, in cycling, but also out of cycling, I've had a quite a um, quite, quite a ups and downs in my in my private life too. So you know, there's I, obviously it's it's always easy to give advice, but it's just you 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 know I've lived in I think six countries now. Um, went through divorces, divorce, one's enough. Uh, but all these are the things kind of help with, you know, even how to, to help out with, with taxes, um, to, to move to one place, move to the other place. I've, I've had quite some, some knowledge I could share because cycling is great and you can talk about diet and training and, uh, and go and um, on racing all you want. But cycling is also, you have to take care of all the rest about, you know, physios, um nutritionist uh, everything can kind of click and there's a lot of information and a lot of things to to do and to look after uh, the other thing and and we talked a little bit about it was the pressure of expectation because of your name I, I think like so sam bennett exploded into the irish sports consciousness over the last couple of years as well like you you do know what it's like to be high profile in a way that uh not a lot of cyclists have had to deal with essentially since your dad's era when everything that your dad and Sean Kelly did was front page news all the time. There was like a pack of Irish journalists following them at the time. They were on TV all the time. They were on radio all the time. And then there was a, a massive lull. And then yourself and your cousin uh, kind of re-established Irish interest in cycling. And then Sam took it to the next level by winning the, the green jersey. And, I, you know, I, I don't know if the, that generation, that next generation of cyclists Hopefully they will get the coverage and the coverage will continue, but it's not an easy thing to deal with, I suspect. No, it's not. It's not easy. Uh, and look, what what Sam did to win the green jersey uh, was absolutely uh, fantastic. And and just by winning the stages already in the Giro, without even going to the Tour, which is which is which is humongous. But the stages he won in the Tour the previous year, in, in the Giro the previous year, was it four stages in the Giro? That was like wow. We had, no one had had been capable of doing that since, since I don't even think Kelly won four stages in, in one single um, Grand Tour. And then the year after getting in the green jersey, what I what I, what I I feel um, today is unfortunately with, with, with Sam having his, his issues with his knee, the kind of hype that, he, that was about to explode again in Ireland kind of went down with his knee issue. Um, and unfortunately... I think everyone's kind of waiting for Sam to come back to, to his top level and, and to go and get those really, really important big wins in cycling. We can see Eddie, who is just there and about, always, you know, he's, he's won his first uh, overall race a couple of weeks ago in Italy. He's doing actually very well at the moment in um, in in Italy again, actually, <laughs> uh, in Tour de Alps, it's called. So Eddie is there. The thing is, obviously, when you have the green jersey, 
uh, of the Tour de France again is is next is really really next level. Eddie now is fighting with like if I was myself or or, or Dan, but you know even Ryan Mullen is he's you know the underdog he might not be as popular uh, or in the media uh, as the other two, but he is there knocking bells. Had a pretty good classic um, season so far. So it's just hopefully that Sam comes back up and and start winning those races more often like he did uh, the last couple of years, and I think it will kick kick off again because cycling has generally exploded since since post COVID or actually during COVID, and then, and although this kind of new uh, cyclists are not really interested in racing, they they like to go. They discovered cycling to go and take a better fresh air, get out of the house when you've been locked in for so long. They're not really interested in racing yet, but I think there is some potential of being um kind of new cycling fans or just kind of following a little bit more what is happening in the cycling world because they enjoy being on the bike and it kind of one will click into the other yeah i I think that's true i think that um owen mentioned drive to survive cycling is really set up for a, a drive to survive where we get the ins and outs of the crazy owners and the the egotistical team leaders and the domestiques and the road captains it's, it's the perfect sport for it is and and you know I from what I understand I think the Tour de France signed with Netflix now, uh, and uh, again like I I absolutely love Drive to Survive and you know living in Monaco for for over ten years I I've been with some of the former Formula One drivers I was more friendly with the older generation like David Coulthard uh, and we go out on the bike and we we talk cars and and obviously he's quite involved with the Formula One and and I've always kind of followed it from from afar but but I just like many people just fought that in love with the show and, and it just is so interesting it's, it's almost like a Hollywood movie rather than a, than, than a reality um, series and I think that if cycling are courageous enough to really go into um, the conflicts and you know we don't want to see everybody hugging each other and telling them how brilliant they are that, w- that would be terrifyingly boring <laughs> where and, and also untrue I think why Drive to Survive works is because you can actually feel that they're not all best buddies. Uh, and sometimes I feel in the cycling world, you, they want to make you feel that you always love and hug and shake hands and it's great, but it's not always like that. There is competition. You're, you're there to beat the other guy and you can have respect. Uh, don't take, you, know, you can be competitive and, and have respect. One doesn't go without the other. Uh, but, um, but, but, but not everyone is friends and it would be good if they do really open up into those tensions and people talk freely uh, rather than always trying to be kind of very socially correct. Who, who's the member of the Peloton that you would be most looking forward to seeing getting the inside track on on Netflix? I don't know, actually. That's also one of the things that will make um, this very complicated is if you look at it as a whole, like the Tour de France is 190 cyclists. It's not... 20 pilots so it's a lot more difficult to go into who do you talk to and I think sometimes you know again when you're a team leader all that you, you kind of have to be in your bubble and you isolate yourself and and I think sometimes it would be almost more interesting to go into someone who is maybe not as famous who is doing his first Tour de France who is struggling rather than going for the first kind of top 10 in GC and a few top sprinters there and going again developing the the kind of faces that we know that speak every weekend in in the media i think it'll be a lot more interesting if it actually went into some of the the newer riders or again riders who are suffering or riders who just had a crash uh and who are kind of who are more like i said maybe not mediatically interesting interesting because they're not the highest profile but they might have you know easier ways to communicate um, one last thing, you, you talked there about the uh, increase in cycling. Myself and I have both uh, dabbled a little bit, uh, particularly since COVID. It's generous to us. Uh, exa- a little bit generous to us. Uh, <laughs> do you feel that, though, generally, that um, particularly in Ireland, that like we, we have this very rich tradition of cycling that like, goes way, way, way back? Uh, and it, it feels a little bit like the sport is kind of rising again, but that it's going to need a concerted effort and a very unified front and every opportunity that we have to talk about it and to push it, and particularly just the safety aspect of it for for uh, for us, uh, for uh, the amateur cyclists and for parents getting their kids into it. Like that's another big thing that we could all do with a significant push on. Oh, I I hundred percent agree with you. Uh, and you know when I when I, I in Ireland I, I I'm always kind of busy so I do drive as well and and I do see sometimes you know it is difficult to to overtake there's no room to overtake 
uh, cyclist and you have to be very patient, which not everybody uh, has that, that, that skill. But also even in the city center, I, I found that some of the, the, the lanes, uh, you know, you, you suddenly arrive and there's a pole just in the middle and you don't know where it's coming from. Um, and, and it is, safety is, it is a preoccupation and, and you know, I mean, it, it's what I appreciate it. It's great to see a lot of people wearing kind of high vis colored clothing and, and also lights. I think lights are, are key, especially here in Ireland, um, the rear light, but I, I even wore the, the headlight here when I was back in the winter, just because the light was so, was so low, but, but obviously helmet is, is, is essential. Uh, I wouldn't go out without, without a helmet. But again, I think traffic, especially coming towards the center, is is, is very, very um, dangerous. And, and you just need to be always, always cautious. And as, as you know, there's so much that can happen that you cannot control. But I think that there's no chance to kind of not, not be cautious. But but it is a main preoccupation. And, and look, I'm, I'm lucky enough to be here in, in, in Dundrum and just shoot out into the Wicklow Mountains. And I'm kind of way out of traffic. Um, but but I, I know that when you're kind of close to, to a town centre, it could be quite sketchy and, and it is a major preoccupation. Yeah. Do, do you feel... Look, there, there is a lot of um, a new greenways, aren't there, being being built around Ireland and uh, I think that's very encouraging though. For sure. Do, do you feel it's, it's less safe to, to cycle around Dublin City compared to, say, cities in, in, in France, Belgium, Netherlands? No, to, in, in fairness, uh, I, I think cycling in cities, as much as is being promoted and, and pushed by politics and, and every government, and, and they are trying to create um, all these new accesses. Um, unfortunately, I think the older cities is just more difficult because um, usually they're, they're just narrower and there's no space to have a bus lane, a cycle lane, a e-scooter lane, a car lane and a taxi lane when has been two lanes for 50 years and you're trying to make four lanes out of two lanes basically so i think they are um they are conflicted with with, with some some historical issues where more modern cities or newer cities um when they are growing or developing in more in modern areas it's easier to to think ahead and to put a proper bike lane there or a proper bus lane there which kind of makes it safer but look I, i've i've cycled it in in most um countries and major cities and unfortunately the the, the problem of, of cycling lane is, is a big 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 issue in, in all of them Nico great to have you with us this morning best of luck with the new gig and thanks a million thanks a million that's uh, Nico Roach there he's helping to promote um, the fact that Penergy have been today announced as the uh, main sponsors for the Orwell Wheeler Cycling Club it's a three year sponsorship deal uh, they'll become the club's principal sponsor and official energy partner as well as the title sponsors of the Pinergy Orwell Wheelers Randonnée which is an annual 146 kilometer open road event which takes place in Dublin on Saturday April the 30th that's nine days to get ready for 146k could you do it? Yeah of course yeah How far could you go? I could I could probably I could probably push myself to 70, 75 now Could you? Yeah That was quick Yeah It's amazing how quickly it does I, I haven't done that now but I've done I've done 50 and I haven't I didn't feel bad after 50 at the weekend at all I could have kept going wow um, but you're a dark horse uh, no like times it was on a greenway you see that's that doesn't count a, gre- a greenway 50 is like an, a regular roads 35 maybe I don't know it's a, I mean I'm very impressed considering you know where you've come from I don't I don't think I've co- gone very far at all you haven't seen my times you don't know how long it took me I mean it's the fact that you finished it that's all that matters